Welcome to the Wooden Canoes, the amazing history and exciting future. Uh, our presenter is uh, Steve Lapey, uh, who's the chapter head of the local chapter of the Wooden Canoe Heritage Association, and he's also the owner of Stephen's Canoe work, Works. So Steve, if you want to uh, unmute and take over, that would be great. White Rose Canoe Shop. Michael and Keith have put together a great canoe shop here with a good assortment of uh, new canoes from Novacraft, Winona, Merrimack, Merrimack, and others. And they also offer an interesting assortment of vintage wooden canoes. If you're in the market for a new canoe, an old wooden canoe, or just a new paddle or a PFT, White Rose is the place to shop. They've got it all. It's really a nice uh, shop. They've done a really good job. Tonight, we're gonna to briefly uh, cover the history of the wooden canoe what's happening and what the future looks like for these canoes. If you have any questions, either use the reaction menu in Zoom to raise your hand, post it in the chat, or just ask. The canoe has been around for thousands of years, starting as the dugout used all around the world, carved from a single large log. They must have taken a long time to make one, especially working with the crude tools that were available to them. Here in North America, in the areas where a proper species of trees were available, the natives developed the bark canoes. Some were made of elm, that doesn't work too well. The better ones are made from birch and cedar. The native birch bark canoes are easier and faster to make with simple tools than the earlier dugouts and they reform, perform very well. When the first Europeans arrived here, they were amazed at how the, well the natives got around in their canoes and they wanted to have them also. The French up in Quebec tried to set up factories to make canoes in quantity, hiring natives to do the building. That worked for a while, even resulting in the huge canoes du Nord used to bring furs to Montreal from all over Canada. Some of these big canoes were uh, as long as 36 feet long and carried tons of, of cargo and trade goods. No matter how well the bark canoes were made, they usually had one major flaw, they all leaked. There are great tale, there are tales of great expeditions that mention patching the bark canoe every evening. Pine pitch and bear fat needed to be carried along on every trip. The Europeans tried to improve on the native canoe by making them from milled planks of wood. Basswood and cedar both made nice lightweight canoes, but they had the same serious flaw. They all leaked. Somewhere around 1870, a guide in Maine named Evan H. Garish got the bright idea to build a light wooden frame and cover it with waterproof canvas to make a canoe similar to the bark canoes that he'd been using. After a few attempts, he came up with a canoe that looked a little like what we have become used to seeing as the wooden canvas canoe. As soon as the other guides and sportsmen saw the Garish canoe, they all wanted the same thing. Garish then set up shop in Bangor and was soon making a dozen or so a year Soon he had several employees and production increased. He continued making his canoe until he retired in about 1910. The company continued on for a few years before closing up. By the 1890s, other builders got into the wood canvas canoe business just in time for the great canoe fad of the early 1900s. Canoe rental deliveries became popular in many US and Canadian cities and the demand for canoes became huge. In Maine, by the early 1900s, there were dozens of builders. A few of the more noble ones are B.N. Morris, Carleton, Old Town, E.M. White, J.R. Williams, Kennebec, and Skowhegan. Here in the Boston area, we're familiar with uh, several builders who worked to furnish canoes to the various liveries. Locally, John R. Robertson became a leader in the industry. He set up shop on the Charles River, both building canoes and operating a canoe livery. His canoe continued until 1940. Robertson's daughter married a Mr. H.E. Crandall from Worcester. Crandall started his own canoe factory and livery on Lake Quinsigamog. Somewhere around 1902, Robertson went up to Old Town, Maine to help the Gray family set up their canoe factory. At the time, it was the Indian Old Town Company. Soon the sign on the building read, Robertson Old Town Canoe Company. Apparently the arrangement didn't work out exactly as planned. And by 1903, the sign read Old Town Canoe Company and Robertson was back in Boston. <laughs> 
Alden Kingsbury and John Sunderhoff had worked for Robinson for a while. Then they went west to Monahan, Washington and formed the Monahan Canoe Company, making and selling canoes there. In about 1915, Kingsbury returned to the Boston area and started his own canoe factory in Weston, right across the river from Norumbega Park. From 1915 until 1947, he made over 1,400 canoes, many sold to Norumbega Park. Kingsbury canoes are highly collectible today. Other Charles River builders included Fred Broadbeck in Dedham. We have a Broadbeck canoe right here in the room uh, with the vintage canoes here at White Rose. The Waltham Canoe Company, Nuttings and Arnold were all within sight of one another in Waltham. The Charles River builders all made very similar canoes. Today, unless there's a builder's tag or a label on the canoe, it may be impossible to identify the builder. The great canoeing craze of the 1900s eventually quieted down. First, the bicycle became popular. Then the automobile became available to more folks. And after World War II, the wooden canvas canoe started to be replaced by aluminum and fiberglass canoes. Today, aluminum and fiberglass has been replaced by carbon fiber, Kevlar, and who knows what. Steve? Yes. Just a sec. So uh, I find this one particularly interesting, just to interrupt a bit, sure, uh, sure. particularly the fact that in 1903, an old town canoe cost you between 28 and $48. If you kissed a girl in an old town canoe in 1903, you would be fined $20, half the price of your boat. Price of a new canoe, my goodness. <laughs> so uh, banned in Boston really applied here. <laughs> Today, there are still wooden canvas canoe builders making new canoes. The ones being made today are, for the most part, replicas of popular models from the past, designs that have withstood the test of time and need no improvements. Also, the canoes being built today, since they're made in small quantities, the builders all spend a lot more time tending to the details than the old builders did when they were pushing out a commodity as quickly as possible. Building the wood canvas canoe requires a solid building form made to the exact shape of the canoe to be made. It is furnished with steel bands at each rib position and has mounting points for two stems and the two inner gunnels. The ribs are placed in a steam box for about 20 minutes before they are quickly bent over the form and nailed to each gunnel. Where the ribs pass over the stems, they're nailed into notches in each stem. With all the ribs in place, the planking begins using sharp brass tacks that hit the steel bands and then get clinched over, creating a very tight connection. With most of the planking done, the new hull comes off the form and the work continues, finishing up the planking, installing decks and thwarts, among other tasks, before it's time to varnish the interior and cover the hull with a canvas. Covering the hull with canvas is always a fun job. There are several ways folks do this. Some do it with the hull upside down on high saw horses. Others do it as we do, right side up with about 200 pounds of dead weight in the hull for the downward stretch. The canvas is secured in special clamps at each end and pulled tight with a come along. Then the canvas is stapled to the hull with stainless steel staples. The staples will go through the canvas, the planking, the rib, and right into the inwheel. The canvas is filled and waterproof with a special filler made from linseed oil, mineral spirits, paint, and ground silica. The filler goes on in a three-step process and then has to cure for four to five weeks before the enamel paint can go on. Other tasks include making and installing the thwarts, seats, and keel if requested. On the screen is a picture of our, one of our club members, Lawton Gaines, applying the first coat of filler on our Kennebec project canoe back in 1916. The whole process of building is very labor intensive. I think that was 2016, Steve. I'm sorry, did I say 1916? <laughs> yeah. I, I got so, uh, tied up in uh, reading about 1900 and 1903. I went right to 1920 <laughs> or 1960. 
The repairing of, and restoring of old wood canoes is a popular activity. There's a difference. A repair consists of fixing something that's broken and returning the canoe to service. A restoration means addressing all parts of the canoe and bringing it back to new, near new condition. One of the beauties of the wood canvas canoe is that they can always be repaired and brought back to like new. If you have a pile of broken wood in some time and effort, I'll bring it back to a usable vessel. Oftentimes we have people show up with an old canoe that's been in the family for years and through neglect it has fallen into disrepair. Sometimes the restra restoration cost exceeds the cost of a new build, but since it's a family heirloom, cost is no object. Here on the screen is a picture of a Robertson canoe that came in and, as a basket case and went out looking like this. Recently on repairs, recently here at the canoe shop, we had a canoe that had been inside a garage being stored correctly out of the weather, safe and dry. Safe until a giant oak tree came down, destroyed the garage, the automobile and the canoe. The insurance company came out and easily took care of the garage. The automobile was replaced soon enough, but the family's big problem was what to do about the canoe. Insurance coverage was limited, wasn't gonna cover all the repairs. One entire side of the canoe had been crushed between the oak tree and the caddy. There were 22 broken ribs. Both the in-whale and the out-whale were snapped on one side and a lot of the planking was broken. The canoe was in the shop for several months, but when it went home, it was as good as new and the family was pleased. And I think we have a couple of pictures of the uh, crushed canoe and it coming out pretty much. So, yeah. So Steve, the, the in-well and out-well snapped is the one over here in the corner? Yes. Okay. Were all the ribs snapped on one side or were they? They were all, fortunately, they were all snapped on one side of the canoe, leaving the other side of the canoe relatively close to its original shape. So we uh, made a pattern of each and every rib uh, in that broken area, made a pattern for a, uh, what you might call a call or a, a small form to reproduce the correct curve. And we screwed that to the broken rib on the opposite side. When you got them all in place, we had the thing back in shape. Then we were able to go in and replace the ribs one at a time. It took forever. but. They wanted it because it was on Abigail's canoe and uh, she would have wanted it that way. And we also have another a couple of pictures of uh, a repair where we uh, made and installed new decks. As you can see, the old decks were pretty well destroyed and we fitted in new decks and uh, sent it out pretty well fixed up. I'm sorry, was there a question out there? No? Okay. I haven't heard the question. <laughs> The future of wooden canoes, from where I sit, the future of wooden canoes is bright. For a surprising number of paddlers, the canoe of choice is still wooden canvas. It's difficult to describe the difference, but it's real. If you get the chance to paddle a real wooden canoe, you'll soon enjoy for yourself the maneuverability and quiet and easy glide that's missing in the modern canoes. There's also a continued interest in home building new canoes, it requires a fair investment in tools, equipment, and the materials. There are several good books available which teach the beginner step-by-step step the building process. It isn't rocket science. It just takes a lot of attention to detail to end up with a great finished product. Keith has a couple of slides on this as well. Pretty much winds up my part of the presentation. Thank you very much for your time tonight. It's a uh, been an experience and uh, been fun and I'm glad to see you and I'll turn it over to Keith. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Steve. So I just wanted to go over a little bit of the end and then I want to throw it open for questions. Obviously, we blew through the slides. We were expecting a few more interruptions than we got. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, as Steve mentioned, there's a solid community of uh, wood canoe fans out there. And that doesn't seem to be getting smaller. In fact, the Canoe Heritage Association memberships up. Um, instructors are still there. Uh, we've got 65 vendors in the builders ads alone, besides folks who are not advertising through that. One of the other things that I'm particularly uh, interested in is, you know, the new generation coming along. 
And what I didn't know about until uh, I started running into some folks uh, once we became a canoe only shop is there's a series of canoe camps uh, in Maine, Minnesota, and a lot of them are up in uh, Ontario and Quebec um, that are focused on wilderness canoe trips with wooden canvas canoe using old style techniques. These tend to be age grouped. So the total span of ages might be from seven year old to 18 year olds, but they tend to be in two to three year spreads. Um, they're in single gender sections, which just makes it a lot easier to manage. So the boys go one way and the, and the girls go the other. They're using, like I said, the wooden canoe. So I'll give you some numbers on how many. But what's really interesting is they're using the traditional tump lines, you know, the, the ones that go over your head and hold things on your backs, both to carry the canoes on portages and to carry all their gear. Um, the uh, using for carrying the gear, they're using the portage packs as well as wanigans, which are literally square wooden boxes that they'll put um, cooking gear and food and those kinds of things in. And that's pretty much what the old voyagers would do as well. And the classic load for a voyager would be a wanigan and two packs of pellet, a pelt, yeah, sure, fur, sorry about that, trying to say pelts. Uh, the pelt packs weighed 95 pounds each. So they'd be carrying 180 pounds of pelts and a wanigan. Um, hernias were not unusual, <laughs> literally, it's true. Um, uh, and these guys, they're not carrying quite so much weight, but they're, they're using those same traditional techniques. And the oldest of these camps actually started in 1893. So they've been around for a while. And to give you an idea of some of the sizes that they've got, uh, Kiwaden, uh, which is the one that has uh, the picture that you saw there, that was a group of 17, 18 year olds on a seven week wilderness trip out of the camp heading for Hudson Bay. Um, uh, Kiwaden's got a fleet of 200 of these wooden canvas boats. Uh, you can see the Taylor Stanton camps, which is another one of the big ones um, and so on. And there's actually a list that's, I don't know, probably 20 camps long of folks who have various numbers of these wooden canvas uh, canoes. And as I said, the program's age uh, varies by age and the trips by age and length. Um, and they take adults if you're interested in putting one of those things on your back and going across. Um, if you wanna learn more, um, the Wooden Canoe Heritage Association, which again was a new thing to me until uh, I started working here and we got into the canoes, has been around for quite a while, 1940, I think it started. Uh, it's a nonprofit. It's dedicated to preserving uh, wooden canoes, both all wood and wooden canvas. And that's kind of the wrap up. Uh, here's a bit about Steve. He it was nice enough to talk about the shop. So we thought we'd uh, give you a little bit of background on him as well. He does run, as we said at the start, Stevens Canoe Works, which is located over in Groveland. Um, and not only does he build boats, but if you want to lend a hand, uh, the chapter members from uh, the uh, uh, Norm Vega chapter, which is the one that covers this area, head out there on Saturday mornings and, and lend a hand. So you can actually get some hands-on experience with doing this if you're interested in doing it. Mm -hmm. And just a little bit more info, I needed to give photo credits for all the photos I stole out of the canoeing book. And uh, that book, by the way, there's a copy of it out there on the table someplace. Uh, but this book, A Canoe is a Natural History in North America, really fascinating if, if you're at all interested in this it's it's the one source that kind of covers everything from the dugouts all the way through um, the modern synthetics as well and that's uh, just a link because uh, we're going to post the slides for you to see if you're interested in looking at that list of all the uh, camps that's the link that you would hit to go look at those wooden canvas canoes okay so that's the uh, planned part of the presentation uh, again, we'd like to open it up for questions, uh, if you have any, and we can go back to any of the charts if you want to look at them a little bit longer and those kind of things. So what can we answer for you? Can I make a comment? Absolutely. 
so my grandson spent three years at Kiwaden up in uh, Ontario. Uh, unfortunately, his, his last transportation was out by float plane to get his appendix fixed. <laughs> oh, <gee. laughs> yeah, but they, they used tump lines and, you know, they learn how to use them. Uh, actually, his older sister had a tump line. And I can't remember the camp, but there was one in Maine where, where she learned that. Mm -hmm. yeah so yeah so if and, you got I, I go ahead have one question uh does the location of the canoe store uh that's uh goes all the way back to parker river uh, that's Fern correct Fern yes Fern it was, yes it was fernald's yeah so my first canoe was 1968 where i bought a modern fiberglass canoe uh, which was finally destroyed when ice fell off the roof. <laughs> uh, and I couldn't carry it anymore anyway, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This shop um, was uh, Fernals for Michael. How long? Do you have a sense? Yeah, originally it was a restaurant in the 20s and then it became a boat shop. It was Fernals for a long time. Michael Duffield, the, Duffield, the owner who's sitting here, um, after the Fernals retired out, you know, kind of aged out of the business, it, the shop lay quiet for about a year. And then Michael picked it up in 2014, um, started his Newberry Kayak and Canoe. And we switched to White Rose Canoe uh, just this past September. Uh, Michael uh, came in one day and said, what do you think about only doing canoes? I appreciated the fact that uh, he asked uh, only because we have a very simple organizational structure here. Uh, Michael is the owner. I'm the staff. That's it. <laughs> so if you want to speak to staff, that's me. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and we thought that was a good idea. We think that there's a, uh, uh, a underserved, unrecognized uh, population of enthusiastic canoe paddlers. And we felt, hey, we like canoeing too, so why don't we focus on that? So uh, that's when the switch happened, uh, just this past September. We had planned to be around for a while. Outside wall, this is the inside wall of that. Oh, I'm I sorry, sir? A, I have a tree right here, appears to be this tree. This building appears to be this tree. Somebody speaking? Uh, okay, go ahead, sir. Mr. Fitzgerald. I just wanted to mention I have uh, restored a number of canoes that originally went to Fernald's. Oh, uh, cool. According, according to the build record from uh, Old Town. Yeah. Well, they, they were what? The largest Old Town they dealer? They were a pretty, uh, pretty good sized dealer for Old Town for several years. Yeah, they were, they were the largest Old Town dealer for many years. Yeah. Stuart tells me it's because they gave them away at a very low price, very low markup. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> Whatever it worked. What, yeah, I, I, yeah. I was Any other questions? Years, and I found that if you sold something for a low price, you sold more of it. But uh, yeah. what do I know? <laughs> uh, a wooden canoe used for canoe tripping generally uh, weighs in the area of 70, 75 pounds. Uh, that, uh, considered portageable. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I grew up uh, with uh, wood canvas canoes at canoe camp, and uh, we managed yeah. to carry them, and uh, I still use them today. It's, it's not impossible. Yeah, I it's... heard people describe there's a, uh, um, a guide service up in Lake Poole called Pusa, and they do a lot of wilderness canoe trips, and they use just the traditional canvas canoes. Uh, I've heard it's kind of a I've never paddled a what is so special about the wood canvas? I'm going to repeat the, Steve. I'm yes, going to re yes. I'm going to repeat the question for the folks. Who right, get it. Right. So the the question that was asked is, um, a gentleman has had some heard about guide services and those kind of things that use wooden canvas. People have used them have commented that there's something magical about the experience, and he was asking, wondering what made that so. So Steve, it's very hard to describe, but it's just. What, just a feeling that you get when you're in it and you're gliding through the water almost silently. 
you're just that much closer to nature when you're in a natural wooden canoe. Um, you just have to try it. And uh, the first trip around the pond, you'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Frequently, it's described in terms of flexibility that an aluminum canoe doesn't give very much. You know, a Kevlar canoe doesn't, doesn't change shape or direction. A wood canoe, wood canvas canoe, is known for giving a little bit, flexing over the waves. You, it's a lot quieter in general. Um, hunters tend to prefer it because you can get a lot closer, or bird watchers and such, because you can get a lot closer without making noise. And just as soon as the wood canvas people get all excited about that, the birch bark people come along and say, yeah, we can do you one better because bark is <laughs> But the wood canvas is a little bit more affordable than the average birch bark. Yes. <laughs> Us lobster paddlers are the same way. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Everybody's like that. Over there. Oh, I was wondering if you would talk about uh, the... Um, the feature of a canvas against the uh, against the hull does it slide? Does it is it forgiving more than uh, the other ones? Uh, it's, it's, it's two it's two hulls. Something? It's considered two hulls and one a canvas hull over a, a wooden hull, and and the two materials do move independently of each other when you hit an obstruction or something of that nature. Uh, the, the the canvas is not glued to the uh, right. To the to the wood and the canoes, it's only attached around the edges and at the ends. So, so it gives the canoe a little bit of resilience. Certain amount of resilience. Yeah, it, it 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 bends quite a little bit before it breaks. They do break, <laughs> but then again, just about anything will break. You hit it hard enough. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, this is perhaps ironic coming from me, but um, assuming. You go on Craigslist or whatever like that. There sometimes are endless numbers of canvas canvases. What do you look for if you want to buy? Let's say one that needs some restoration. What do you want to look for? What do you want to look for? Well, if you wanted to pick up a old wooden canoe for a restoration project, either to restore yourself or to have someone do the work for you, the more that's broken is the more it's gonna to cost to repair it, like almost anything else. You wanna look for one that hasn't lost its basic shape and you wanna look for one that hasn't been completely rotted out at the ends. Uh, I'll be the first to say, I, I've sent a bunch of them to the burn pile. The, that just plain weren't weren't worth pursuing. You can't save them all. It'd be nice to think you could, but uh. so so Steve, um, it sounds like what you want to look at are the the stems, the bow and the stern area. Is that where you tend to pick up the most damage? Yeah, the most uh, the most rotted uh, damage is is almost always at the ends. People uh, put the things out on the yard and they put them up on end and the rest of the the end of the uh, canoe is, is in the mud and it gets wet and then it gets dry and gets wet and dry and then the, the rotting process starts. It's not that big a deal if, if it's within reason, it's not that big a deal to replace a six or eight inches of uh, in whale and out whale on each end along with maybe six or eight inches of the, of the stem with a, with a patch. That's done on a routine basis. It's not that big a deal. Um, if, if the canoe is in one piece and not not terribly broken and rotten, almost any canoe is, is is worth any wooden canvas canoe is worth buying and 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 enjoying after you get it fixed up. Steve, how many canoes have you? Model canoes. Now we're talking a whole different. Subject. Okay. I'm sorry, we've, we've... <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, the prospector is, that's going to depend what you want to do with it when you're, when you're done. Do you want to go on a, on a wilderness trip up in Canada or up in Northern Maine? You might want to look for a prospector. You're going to be paddling on the uh, Charles River. 
you might want a, something like that broadback. Uh, that broadback is an 18 foot canoe and weighs 85 pounds. You're not gonna take that on a wilderness canoe trip. The prospector, the one above it is uh, about 72 pounds, it's 16 feet long and it's wide and deep. It'll carry a huge load. That's the one you wanna take on a wilderness canoe trip. One up on top is for taking your lady friend out on the, uh, again, on the Charles River, or someplace fancy uh, with that gold leaf. You're not gonna take that on a, on a, on a wilderness trip. Either. Okay. Folks, I'm gonna quickly try and uh, get my phone on so we can take show you in the shop kind of what he's talking about for the folks at home there. Um, but continue asking questions and uh, let's let's take a minute. I'm sorry, Michael. Anybody on the on the video have a question? We've been kind of doing it with in shop people here for a minute. No, okay. Press that. <laughs> sorry. Steve, what about oftentimes when we're looking at these canoes? Yeah, Steve, how many canoes have we restored over the years? Uh, that's something to be okay. concerned about. I think of a couple this year. Some are older fiberglass that's easier as opposed to some later fiberglass. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I had two questions here. One, somebody was asking a question online and Mike Parr was asking a question. I, I'll, I'll address Mike's question first. Uh, on the fiberglass canoes, uh, a lot of wooden canoes have been covered with fiberglass over the years and it, it can almost destroy a canoe by doing that. It, it's not the right thing to do. So in a restoration, the first thing you want to do is remove the fiberglass. And if you're lucky, when they did the fiberglass and they put the glass on with polyester resin, which doesn't adhere real well to the wood. So it, it comes off in big sheets in about 10 minutes. If you're unlucky, the guy did a good job and he used epoxy resin to apply the glass and smart money's just gonna walk away from that one because that's on there to stay. It will come off with a heat gun. But it takes a lot of heat and a lot of time, a lot of effort. It will come off, but you're going to work at it on that one. Then I, I had a question from someone else uh, on the um, on the screen. I, I I I I'm not sure who that was. Could you repeat that one, please? Silence. Okay. I think someone asked how many how, over your Somebody lifetime how you've been sure. How many canoes I've restored? I've lost count. Uh, approaching 100 in the last 30 years in, in my shop over in Groven. It's the durability of those canoes to take a wilderness trip or some rapids. And how many of us have you trained over <laughs> the years to re redo your canoes? How many have I trained? Yes. Oh, I don't know how many uh, of our club members we've, we've had in in training sessions, but we've had Dozens. Uh, the other question that came from the floor was, uh, how long will a, a wooden canoe last? At, at, wood canvas canoe. I have one in the shop uh, now that just, it's, it's been with us for a week and it's gonna get canvas tomorrow. Uh, it's a Rushton canoe, it was built in 1904, 1905. So it's 115 years old. And it, 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 it's had a good life because it, it was, owned uh, by a Boston area family for, for years and years and years. They kept it inside. Oops. It came in, it, it, in 120 years, it doesn't have one single broken rib or one piece of planking that needed to be replaced. Did need some repairs, but very, very few. It's gonna go back out and it's, it's gonna last for another 100 years. So yeah, if you take care of them, they will last just about forever. The durability on some of our rivers, let's, let's be honest. If you're gonna go down the uh, east branch of the Penobscot River, Royal X is the magic word. <laughs> if, if you wanna take one of these nice wooden canoes down or, or down a rocky rapids, you're on your own. It's, that's what portaging is all about. I can comment that in 1968, I was in a wooden canvas canoe at, at a boys camp uh, going down Chase's Rapids on the, the uh, Allagash. Oh yes. And broke it right in half, folded it right around a rock 
And in about two hours, they had it ready to go again. They actually cut cedar to make some patches. <laughs> <laughs> we had, yeah, ambroid glue, uh, something that they heated up. You know, these were the, the council, actually they were the owners of the camp. Um, and it lasted fine for the rest of the trip. <laughs> so I can repairable. Sometimes when you're out there in the woods, uh, you're on your own and you have to you have to figure it out or else you'll be walking home. But I really think that's a philosophical difference the notion that it's a kind of right and you're not I don't know if you all were able to hear Michael's comment, but he was uh commenting that uh you know different attitude about you knew you're in a wood canoe you were ready to fix it if in case you hit something i mean you know it's just the approach that you took uh, with some of the routine maintenance of the care and feeding of the wood canoes care and maintenance of the wooden canoe routine painting and sanding the the gunnels and revarnishing eventually we got revarnishing the, the inside the canvas, if it's damaged, can be repaired. Ambroid cement is uh, what we use for years, but it's not made anymore. They've been using Duco cement, which is a similar product, uh, like airplane glue, with a patch of canvas. You, you can patch them up. Pretty big cuts can be patched with that method, and it'll last for many years. Uh, probably after 20, 25 years, if the canoe uh, has been used a, a fair amount, the canvas is probably going to be tying out, going to have to be replaced. It's like putting tires on an automobile, putting canvas on a canoe. It's a, Don't we all wish we could put our tires on every 25 years? Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Up tape works well, too. <laughs> One thing, Steve, that I, I noticed as, again, as I was going through and getting myself educated, uh, and you may have, if you happen to be looking at the right spot, the right time, it's going through the chart with that old birch bark canoe that they've got up in uh, the main um, maritime museum. I had not real, I'd always thought that birch canoes were, you know, bark, ribs, and away you went, but they're actually fully planked like the uh, wooden canvas boats are. Um, and that kind of surprised me. The main difference in terms of structure is simply that they're generally built right side up as individual craft without a mold. The wooden canvas have essentially all the same parts built upside down on a mold, which makes them much easier to do kind of in a production online style than the, the old birch canoes. Did I get that right, Steve? Yes, you got that pretty much right. The uh, the bark is on the outside. The the planking, the thin uh, strips of uh, cedar planking is laid inside the uh, mm -hmm. bark hull in the building process, and then the ribs are are, are pressed in, and they hold the uh, planking in place, and they're they're lashed in along the uh, along the gunnels. Yeah, it's all completely opposite of what we do with uh, building the modern. Yeah. Yeah, they started starting at the outside and moving in as opposed to inside moving out. Correct. Okay. Any other questions? I think we've done good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we hope you in, uh, enjoyed the, the presentation. Uh, and if you have any additional questions or whatever, uh, please feel free to send them into the shop and uh, we'll get them to... Uh, to uh, Steve. Um, we are going to end the recording and we'll uh, figure out how to get it posted and we'll send, we'll post a link on our website once it's up. Uh, if you'd like us to send you a link individually so you sure you get the notice, just send an email to white rose canoe, all one word, at gmail.com. Okay. Yes, thank, thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Nicely done. Outstanding. Cool, guys. All right. Take care. I'll have a good evening. And, and don't hurt yourselves on Saturday. <laughs> oh, yeah. We got some snow coming.